Good afternoon, everyone. I would like to say good afternoon to everyone in the room as well as on the phone today. Thank you for joining us for the May installment of our Sci-Fi Ontario seminar series. My name is Raymond Ramdale. I'm the current president of Sci-Fi Ontario branch, and it is my pleasure to act as your facilitator today for what I am sure is going to be a very interesting presentation. We are, of course, live here at our Public Health Ontario office in downtown Toronto, and Sci-Fi continues to treasure this partnership that we have with PHO in providing you with informative educational webinars presented by exceptional speakers. I would like the participants who are currently on the line to know that you'll remain in lecture mode for the duration of the call. If you have any questions, please send them through the screen chat pod, and that's located in the bottom right of your screen. So our topic today is uh, geared towards compliance, a regulatory training program for public pool and spa operators. Our presenters today are Fatih, Fatih Shakir G. Olu and Anne Maria Quinn. Fatih is an environmental health manager at Middlesex London Health Unit and has played an instrumental role in shaping the way water facility operators receive regulatory training at Middlesex London Health Unit. He is currently pursuing a PhD at the University of Western Ontario. Anne Maria is a public health inspector and also works for Middlesex London Health Unit. She's played a vital and pivotal role in developing the public pool and spa regulatory training program at her health unit. And Maria also has a Master's of Public Health from Waterloo University. So it is a personal thrill for me today to have both of our speakers here, and also the fact that they come from Middlesex London Health Unit, who happens to be the host of this year's Sci-Fi Ontario Branch Conference, which is being held from September the 29th to October 3rd. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to our speakers. Thank you, Ray, uh, for the nice introduction. Uh, and thanks to everyone uh, here in the room and online uh, participating in our uh, webinar. Uh, I'll just have a quick start. Uh, as you can see, the topic is uh, our pool and spa training program uh, for pool and spa operators. And we are going to also include eventually with the very recent regulatory changes um, non-regulated uh, facilities like um, wading pools and splash pads as well. So that will be a part of our newly designed um, program. The quick outline here, uh, I'll touch quickly the local context, uh, the legal part of the program, the mandate, and Anne-Marie is going to go into deeper about the training program, our background work, how we uh, develop the program, and our future plans as well. Just to give you the geography part of it, as you all know, London is one of the major urban hubs for Southwest Ontario. We have 175 public pools, 50 public spas, and I can add uh, this uh, wading pool and splash pad information, it's around 30-35 range uh, of non-regulated uh, facilities. Now we can say regulated, so we have uh, those as well. Uh, that definitely keeps us busy as safe water team. So the uh, work initially years ago when we uh, started thinking about the how we can enhance the program, what else we could do about it, our strategic plan was our first go-to document, and the plan that was initiated in 2015, which is good between 2015 and 20, clearly focuses on the program excellence and making sure that we deliver maximum value and impact with our resources. And our values are, some of our values, which is relevant to this program work, uh, were health equity and uh, partner collaboration. And they provided a good context and uh, we were able to receive uh, a lot of support from our senior leadership to make sure we spent enough time, energy, and focus to enhance uh, this service. From the legal perspective, as we all know, uh, the mandate uh, from the new standards, even it stayed the same, Prevent, uh, preventing and reducing waterborne illness and injuries related to recreational water use. 
And with the most recent uh, protocol, uh, I just want to set the legal context here. Uh, the Board of Health shall ensure the availability of education and training for owners and operators of recreation water facilities. And there is another mentioning of the training material availability and the promoting the recreation water training to owners and operators uh, or public recreation uh, water facilities. And with the uh, revised regulation, the section uh, six talks about every, every owner of a public pool or public spa shall designate an operator. And also the following uh, part also discusses the training uh, requirement. And it also gives uh, specifics in the regulation as well as in the new protocol where it, where it says um, the components of the training clearly defined here, spelled out as public health legislation and regulations, prevention of illness, and injury or death, the water chemistry, sanitation, uh, the safety equipment, emergency communication and procedures, safety supervision, and the admission standards are the new part added, and record keeping. Before I pass uh, over to Anne, I just want to make sure uh, that uh, just to uh, give you what our approach is, we are not trying to replace the CPO course, and we are making very clear to operators when we have these sessions, we are accustomed towards um, the regulatory part of it to explain what we, uh, to explain to operators what the health unit would be expecting from them to do. And we are designing in a way that it is a training and uh, also a workshop. Now I'll pass it to Ed. Thank you very much, Fatih, and thank you everyone for joining us on this beautiful uh, day. So understanding and implementing the regulatory requirements is one aspect of enabling those who are operating public pools and spas. And we as public health inspectors, as a health unit, play a crucial role uh, in providing this regulatory-based um, education. And as Fatih said, it's not a replacement for CPO. Um, we like to see it as a complement for the CPO course or other um, training programs or courses that are out there because um, they deal more on that operational side of it and we deal more kind of where kind of within our scope um, and where we can train um, those operators. Okay, so when looking at uh, how we we're going to structure the training program, it was important for us to look at kind of those short-term goals or kind of where we really wanted to build our foundation, and that's the increased knowledge and skills of those operators and support staff. So in the beginning when we started this in 2008, it was really geared towards owners and operators, and we kind of started looking at, okay, well, what about the lifeguards? What about janitorial staff? What about all those other people that might be doing chemistry tests or might be opening or closing uh, these facilities? What do they need to know? How can we get them involved and that's kind of where um, opening up that stakeholder um, component really comes in where we're kind of getting information from kind of all who might be involved and how we can help those um, individuals out. So behavior change then becomes that medium or that um, kind of longer term goal where we want behavior change. So we want to see that that increased knowledge and skill is actually put into application on the site and they're doing the record keeping properly, they're doing chemistry tests as prescribed and so forth. Uh, ultimately then we want compliance with the regulations. So if they're complying with regulations, we're kind of correlating that with okay, then there's increased safety, increased or um, decreased um, illness and um, other factors um, so they can operate their premises in a safe and sanitary manner. So the key component of my um, portion of this presentation is to highlight the approach that we took. Um, I'm going to kind of shorten that aspect of it. I know um, if you've listened in prior um, presentations, you've kind of heard bits of um, those. And we're going to really highlight kind of where we're at um, now with the program, taking in consideration all the kind of background work that we've done. So we did a needs assessment. And that was really good in looking at kind of what was going on in kind of our area for inspection reports. So we did an inspection report audit over four years uh, to see the most commonly occurring non-compliance items. So we can kind of get a gist of kind of what are our top three, what are the top five items that we really need to focus on. And that kind of really 
plays into the other components of our needs assessment and the effective intervention identification that we did. We also did focus groups in 2014 and 2015 with operators and owners and support staff who had uh, attended um, prior uh, training programs at the health unit as well as those who hadn't so that we can get the perspectives of both um, what's needed and kind of what they experienced and what they still needed from us and kind of what they expect uh, that the health unit could do for them. Then we had a focus group with the PHIs uh, in 2014 as well to see what they also saw out in the field and kind of the congruencies um, between those two. So the three main themes that came out of uh, that component is the training needs of those operators and owners, timing, location, resources um, to do that, and the barriers that were experienced by the owners and operators, both in attending training as well as implementing what they had learned. So kind of more on-site stuff that we don't really have a lot of control over. Then we had the effective intervention identification, so an environmental scan and seeing what was happening um, in Ontario um, in terms of training programs. Uh, literature search, um, so the legislative compliance um, training programs and their effectiveness. So seeing kind of what we could take out of there that might help our program. <clears throat> So some of those things were um, to provide training at all levels, so that really hit home um, what we were hearing from the focus groups as well and what we kind of got the sense of that you couldn't just give it to managers or um, like the property managers or just the owners, that it was really important to hit all the um, staffing levels. Um, emphasizing significant areas of non-compliance. So, uh, you know, if we're teaching or kind of training on something that they're already doing really well, that's not probably an effective use of our time and resources. So kind of really looking at those areas where operators are struggling and what we can do to help. So uh, we also found uh, through the literature that in-class training and job-specific training together uh, are beneficial, or providing hands-on and a manual, or training in a manual. So kind of the multi-training um, methods, so we're not just speaking to them, or we're not just doing a training component. So that's where the training workshop really um, came about, to kind of incorporate all those um, aspects. And then adult learning um, was kind of a huge point, and we actually have a slide um, coming up on that later. Uh, evaluation component will be fairly short um, because we were hoping to do the evaluation last year. However, um, a number of unforeseen um, kind of barriers, uh, we're going to look at maybe doing that now in the future based on the new improvements that we've done. And again, continuous improvement is a key thing, um, both for the health unit as well as for our team, that we want to continuously um, improve this program and achieve um, our goals. So the training program is evidence-informed. Um, so we took the literature review, the focus groups, and kind of what um, Jillian, my co-trainer, and I have kind of seen in, um, in practice, um, both as inspectors as well as uh, doing the training. Uh, the health equity component, making sure that we're really reaching out to those people that may not be able to come to us. So we have a number of strategies that we have that we can kind of reach more um, operators and staff. And the stakeholder engagement. I can't um, reiterate how important that has been uh, in really uh, making this program kind of comprehensive for us. So for the behavior change, uh, we're looking at um, three components, and it's kind of based on Michi's um, behavior change wheel. And behavior occurs as a result of the interaction between these three conditions. So being capable, um, so whether it be um, like putting ability into action, um, motivation, uh, to have those mechanisms that are available to kind of make that behavior occur or not occur. Um, so some of those things we don't want operators doing, and there are things that we want them to be doing. And then the opportunities, so those are the physical or social enablers that um, allow um, someone to do a behavior within um, an environment. So the adult learning principles, key ones that, we, that kept standing out for us actually were the need to understand why they're learning what they're learning and how it's relevant to their lives. So if we just tell them to do something but we don't really explain the rationale behind it, they're not maybe as apt to kind of uptake um, that information and put it into practice. Uh, Self-direction, adults really like to have a variety of approaches, um, and this 
tends to improve their retention because they're learning from different learning styles, um, different senses, hearing, seeing, um, and actually doing the actions. Prior experience, very important to understand that because they're adult learners, they've had many life experiences through jobs or through life itself, uh, that they can really, if we can kind of connect those um, aspects into what they're learning in our training program, that might be um, something that just kind of adds to their um, toolbox. Self-esteem and self-efficacy. So teaching new skills that increase self-esteem and a sense of self-efficacy in the workplace um, can be actually internally motivating. So um, they're kind of, you know, trying out the hands-on stuff and going, okay, I, I get this. Now I feel more comfortable doing this. I can now take this on site and feel that, you know, they're able to do that. And then applying new knowledge and skills. So this is where Jillian and I will actually bring jugs or buckets of water, um, test kits, and they're able to um, do the test kits on site at the training. Uh, ideally, we'd be at a pool, um, but because lugging jugs of water can be sometimes fun. Uh, but we do that and so that they can actually have that uh, safe environment. Um, and we, that's something we really highlight as well, that it's a safe environment. There are no dumb questions. Um, this is where they are, you know, bounce ideas and problems off each other and us as well. So we've looked at doing theme sessions, actually not looked at, um, we do theme sessions. So that's where we look at previous infraction data. So the key things that have come up year after year um, is documentation and chemistry. So whether it's um, doing chemistry but maybe not knowing how to actually accurately test chemistry and then, you know, their values aren't adding up to our values when we go on to do an inspection, or whether um, they just don't understand kind of what the parameters mean. So those have kind of been um, key things. And I guess lucky for us, they're also very easy things to put into a workshop type model uh, where they can, you know, fill out their record sheet um, based on the chemistry testing that they're doing on site. Um, with us and we kind of go through, okay, this is what ORP means, this is what this means on the record sheet, this is how you fill this part out. Pretty much if you're filling out your log sheet, you've kind of covered your bases and gone beyond, so, because we have some extra components on our log sheet. Um, again, the offering to all staff, um, recruitment, so we've had, um, now it's actually very much word of mouth um, for some of our uh, property management companies, so they'll hear that, you know, um, one of our property management companies brought in 24 of their people. We went out onto their site, were able to actually go to one of their pump rooms, the pool, and have kind of in-class training, and they really like that. So we have more and more property management companies coming through us that way. As well, um, operators themselves are talking amongst themselves um, to get more of them um, into our training. We have a postcard um, that we were mailing out, as well as we do kind of an invite and now with the changes, we'll kind of incorporate um, some of the extra stuff that they need to kind of think about, like, hey, prior to opening July 1st or what have you, May 2-4, um, these are the things to consider um, that are coming up. Um, again, the evidence informed, so always making sure that we're kind of using our evidence, um, whether it be um, previous infractions or whether it's something from literature, anecdotal, um, what have you, always kind of um, tweaking that based on evidence. And then we were lucky enough that we were uh, able to produce a guidebook as well as a logbook. Um, so it tied in nicely with the logbook in that um, we highlighted that as an infraction that we were kind of having continuous issues with. And we were able to say, okay, here's a logbook, numbered pages, fill it out. This is how you fill it out. So we're hoping that that's going to come back to be like, okay, this has been a really positive thing. Um, for evaluation, this is the part that I'll go through fairly quickly because we haven't gotten to um, actually implementing our evaluation. Uh, but what you do is focus your evaluation, prepare to evaluate it, evaluate the program, and then share the results. So kind of it's that continuous um, cycle there as well. So this is actually a picture of the guide that we have now uh, that we're looking at revising this year. So which brings me to the future plans. Um, the revised materials will be based on the new regulation um, that we now have, as well as all the additional information we've kind of learned on adult learning principles, um, focus group um, information, kind of everything we've gathered from behavior change models and those kind of things to um, enhance um, what we have. And then have an instructor's manual 
this kind of ties back into the evaluation component of it um, to have more of a standardized um, system of training um, and kind of holding those training programs just in case Jillian and I all of a sudden got really sick and someone had to cover for us, they'd have the ability to kind of go through an owner, um, instructor's manual and not deviate greatly from kind of how we've been doing it. Um, and then, too, there's always opportunity to improve what we've done, so we're always looking for those um, opportunities as well. For visuals, um, there's a number of things here. Uh, what came to mind was the actual visual of bringing in a bucket and, you know, pretending it's a pool, um, having the test kits, um, having admission standards printed out and laminated, um, ready to go, um, having uh, posters, what have you, anything kind of, again, to hit the different senses that, um, and learning styles. So if people are visual learners, if they're auditory learners, um, then we can hopefully have increased retention. And then the enhanced accessibility. So um, again, this is kind of hitting on a number of points where some people may not be able to come to the health unit, we can go out to them, uh, as well it hits the, um, we're not only limited to uh, the training program during spring months, uh, we used to only do kind of April, May um, months, I guess, uh, for the training, and it was strictly kind of to the health unit, um, and we had some rooms there. So now we have spring, fall, and then in between as well. So this is where customized training comes into play, where if we have a new operator or we have an operator that we continually struggle with getting compliance with, we can actually go on site, um, Jillian and I will generally go, um, and kind of do a customized training as to the issues that they're um, really having and hope, hoping that we can kind of help from a regulatory standpoint. And then where they, um, it's kind of identified that they need help from kind of more of the service professionals or uh, what have you, then we um, also advise um, to get help from there, as well as um, CPO training or other methods of training. Then we have the on-site, so this is um, particularly kind of where the property management companies come in, where we can get groups of 10, um, minimum uh, groups of 10, but we can get 10, 24, 20. We like to play with that kind of 10 to 12 range, because then we can have more interactive um, workshops. And then the, we've actually found that, anecdotally anyway, that um, the attendees are more apt to ask questions and be vulnerable in kind of going, hey, um, my friend's pool has this problem. So we can kind of really go into, okay, so let's deal with what's going on um, there. So what can you do? Um, key thing is know your client. So this is from a number of standpoints, is, um, kind of the infraction data, knowing that you're dealing with adults, um, knowing what behavior um, changes you want to kind of see, um, involving your stakeholders. That's really been a key um, thing for us. Um, the methods of training, so various uh, methods. So the interactive hands-on workshops, um, visual guides, uh, visual materials. Um, yeah, we have kind of the in-class component and the hands-on component, and then making sure that we have capable, motivated um, staff who have opportunities to practice what they've learned and can take back um, to their sites. And we'd like to acknowledge a whole slew um, of people who have been kind of part of uh, this process in one way or another. Um, this is long, <laughs> so it takes a village. And any questions? We're just going to check. <laughs> okay, so thank you very much, Fatih and, and Maria. Uh, we're going to go to uh, the chat box right now, so if you have any questions, please feel free to indicate them there. But before we go there, I wonder if there are any questions from the room. Yes, Ray. Great presentation. Thank you. I was really curious about what you're planning for the gallery. Yeah. Um, so the question, and we're going to have you move over to the mic actually, but I'll just repeat the question, and that is uh, regarding the evaluation and what are sort of the endpoints and the plans moving forward from that. So we've kind of toyed with a number of kind of evaluation tools. Um, there was a pre-post um, idea, so looking at infraction data, seeing if those premises that are attending are actually seeing increased um, compliance versus those that aren't coming. And kind of looking at in public health, it's very hard to look at um, 250 facilities or what have you or, you know, 300 staff members and having them all be trained at the same time. So even looking at a wait list type model so that we can kind of, 
eventually uh, provide that training to everyone, just knowing that we might not be able to do it right away, and it kind of then gives us that control um, as well, as well as those who have uh, come in to do the intervention. So uh, that's kind of the in the preliminary um, process, uh, but even looking at kind of do we do pre post test or um, we're kind of playing with some of those ideas. So yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah, so that's definitely something that has been a key component for the continuous improvement because then we kind of look at, okay, that's where we really need to, you know, this is coming up more than once, twice, um, and that's how we've tweaked um, kind of going through the years and through the months. Uh, and, yeah, we kind of continue to tweak that to be like, okay, what else do we need to ask now? Is there something different here that we can offer? Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we'll turn to uh, our online community now, and I see a question. First question has come up from Thunder Bay Health Unit. How long do your sessions last? Okay, so currently they've been um, around three hours, so we'll do uh, maybe an hour and a half to two hours of the in-class kind of interactive component, and then um, I actually forgot to mention we do have uh, kind of multiple choice, uh, true and false questions throughout the training, so that um, part of it's to make sure, okay, they're kind of still on track with us and we haven't lost anyone, and it gives us that opportunity of um, bringing up those questions and kind of talking deeper into something that might not have been understood clearly. And then, um, but yeah, sometimes that time is just too short and sometimes it's depending on what group we have. So we're playing with what's a perfect um, time as well. And some good follow-ups to those questions are how much they cost as well as whether there's a certification card that's provided at the end. Uh, yeah, it doesn't cost a cent. <laughs> We're just trying to bring uh, people in, and uh, we have been uh, quite successful over the years. Uh, we started quite uh, with lower numbers. Now every year we are going uh, well over 100 participants. And what was the second part? The the certificate. Yeah, we do have a, a certificate uh, for the attendees. Yes. So with that very attractive price point of being free, <laughs> it makes sense then that the next question is, how can the public health unit within southwestern Ontario send their operators to your course? Um, I mean, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a really tough question. <laughs> Uh, at the end of the day, again, it's all public dollars, public service. Um, I, I personally, I don't know, Anne-Marie, what your take would be, but I personally wouldn't see a big uh, issue around it. I mean, we have enough uh, staff compliments, we have sessions, um, and I don't think we are going to get thousands or thousands of people anyway, yeah. not anytime soon. Uh, but yeah, definitely uh, we would welcome uh, operators uh, from neighboring countries if they can make it uh, at the right time, right point. But eventually priority would be uh, we're, you know, given to our operators eventually. But uh, sometimes we might have some spaces. We usually we offer at the health unit office, but we also go off-site. We use mostly uh, London libraries, community center venues. And uh, in some venues, we might uh, have some extra space as well. And we, even if we start getting those uh, interest, we can even think strategically. But as a public health community, we are in the same boat here. So, yeah, we are not opposed to that in principle. Um, yeah, so kind of to add to that, um, what we could sometimes do is we've had some um, that have come from neighboring health units, um, and then sometimes the numbers can be quite daunting. So, um, but I think when we have things like the property management companies, that might be an opportunity where if we're going out on site, they can bring someone from a neighboring health unit that's also working for that property management company. That way, it's kind of like killing two birds with one stone. We kind of hit kind of Middlesex London area as well as we can then bring in other people from the surrounding area as well. I think does that sound fair? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so, and I, I don't want to put you on the spot, I suppose, but um, so if someone is interested, then should they uh, contact you both directly then uh, through email? Or is there a registration form that they fill out? Visit the website? Okay, so the answer to that is uh, to please visit the website, and there's going to be further uh, details there on how they how people can go about uh, signing up. And also we have uh, year-round sessions. It was a bit surprise to us too, but when we offered uh, trainings even 
like in the fall, late fall, close to winter, we had uh, quite a few applicants' interest around it, and those sessions were also quite full. So that was kind of something really interesting. All right. Thank you. Uh, another question that's come up is, uh, do you have a slide presentation that you use? I'm, I'm going to assume that you do have one, and from the sounds of it, you have sort of a, a, a multi-approach uh, yeah. to this, uh, <laughs> utilizing different uh, mediums to, to communicate your message. Uh, the next question from Southwestern Public Health Unit is, for the training material used for the pool fouling, do you refer to the CDC documents or some other Canadian resources? Uh, yes, we've um, referred to the CDC uh, for that and now kind of just highlighting or kind of bringing the operator's attention to the new um, kind of the stabilized chlorine um, standards. Okay. And it looks like Lampton is asking a question that I'm sure a lot of people would like to ask, and that is, would you be able to share the resources, that is the course material, with health units to use in their pool operator courses? So, uh, yes, the, the quick answer is yes. Uh, in the next few weeks, actually, internally finalize that plan. We are going to revise the manual uh, in a uh, considerably short period of time in the next few weeks. We are hoping to have um, that sorted out, that plan. And once uh, it's finalized, I guess that would be, it's right now online, the booklet is online, and we can absolutely have offline conversations with the interested colleagues. Uh, once we have the revised manual and the instructor's manual, um, just like we presented um, earlier, I, I think it would be very much shareable, yeah. It's Catherine Graham's understanding that your pool course may be used by the province. Uh, I wonder, have you heard from the province, and do you know when it may be available provincially? Uh, yes, I think um, last week we had a minister meeting in Toronto, probably quite a few of the colleagues here uh, joined that meeting as well, and there was a conversation at that meeting uh, from the minister representatives, uh, Tony's team, uh, about that plan having uh, a training manual uh, resource uh, adapted by the uh, whole province. I even, spoke, I even had further conversations uh, with the ministry folks, but eventually that could be a possibility. We are going to spend a lot of time to revise our current manual to make sure it's uh, well reflected, the new changes are well reflected on it, and then probably that would be the next stage. So our friends at Hamilton Public Health are wondering uh, if you've considered how long the certification is going to be. And I think it's a good question considering the, the turnover that happens in this particular field and, and the need for recertification. So um, any thoughts in terms of how long someone will be, will be certified for after taking your training? Um, so the certificates that we provide are more of a certificate of attendance um, at this point. So because um, we haven't structured it as an actual course, it's more of a training workshop. So with what we found out through the focus groups is that even if someone's come into our sessions year after year, they're picking up different things each time they come. So, or they're hearing something in a different way that they're able to then apply um, going forward, whether it be, you know, they've gained that life experience or work experience, or they now kind of have a better understanding of the pump room, or um, something just resonates differently with them based on how it's um, coming across to them, or um, just building on that knowledge. So I think uh, that's a tricky question for me to answer kind of um, without kind of literature um, background on that, but um, I think... Yeah, people are really, we're seeing some repeat um, staff members coming out to them and they're consistently saying that, you know, they're enjoying that they have the opportunity to be able to come out as often as they like. I'm going to assume that the, uh, the course is going to be updated and, and revised as needed and with the recreational water codes that may be coming out, uh, will your program change and will, will it be revised at that time? Uh, yes, uh, again, this was a conversation uh, at the minister meeting uh, last week as well, the recreational water code, and the message we received uh, was uh, the code is going to be released uh, very soon in the next, hopefully, uh, couple of weeks or so, 
and I think it, it works perfect with our planning uh, that we are going to start with what we have right now. And I think this code is going to also discuss uh, non-regulated systems in greater detail because in the regulation it doesn't give a lot of um, explanation details about the chemical balance and other uh, details. I think the code is going to help us uh, significantly with that part, which we also like to incorporate. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you. Are there any other questions either from in the room or online? I can see a few people typing, so I'll just give a moment. It looks like just notes of appreciation. So I'd like to echo that appreciation both to everyone in this room as well as everyone online. If you have any other questions and if we didn't happen to get to them, you feel free to reach out to both Fatih and Anne-Maria. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank them very much for a great presentation. And I'd like to thank all of you for taking the time to participate in our Sci-Fi Ontario series. And please ensure that you complete the evaluation for this session. And please uh, look out for uh, further Sci-Fi Ontario uh, series webinars coming soon 